All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. 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 We are here to confront Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all on behalf of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies and to be hosting Mel Leffler from my alma mater, the University of Virginia. Uh, and uh, Peter Hahn will do a formal introduction. I'm Chris Nichols. Uh, I'm a professor of history and the Woody Hayes Chair uh, in National Security Studies at the Mershon Center. And we are all very blessed to have a center like the Mershon Center here uh, at Ohio State. Uh, we will be uh, hearing a very timely talk on the 20th anniversary of the beginning of the Iraq War. Um, this is a moment and an anniversary, in my view, that really lends itself to thinking historically and contextually about what, us, what led us uh, to this moment in 2023, what led the U.S. to that moment in 2002 and 2003, and perhaps to the longer historical uh, processes that got uh, the U.S. and the world to that moment. Um, the Mershon Center's mission is to advance interdisciplinary collaborative approaches to international, national, and human security, and the center supports cutting-edge scholarship and a wide range of programming designed to further our understandings of all sorts uh, of international security questions and hopefully to address those issues to help chart a path uh, that's better for the future. Um, I think as we think about the importance of people and place in starting our conversation today, uh, I'll do something that's very Pacific Northwest of me from where I used to teach at uh, Oregon State University, uh, which is to acknowledge that the land the Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, the uh, Potawatomi, the Delaware, the Miami, the Peoria, the Seneca, the Wanada, the Ojibwe, and many other indigenous peoples. Um, Specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of the tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And as a land grant institution, uh, we want to honor the resiliency of these tribe, tribal nations and recognize the historical context that have and continue to affect uh, the indigenous peoples of this land. And why that's significant in a moment like this, I think is pretty obvious in thinking about the Iraq War and the causes and consequences of the decision making to deploy force in another uh, country and thinking about questions of sovereignty and agency uh, in the world that we live in today and our own uh, place in a nation state uh, that does that kind of work in the world. Uh, so before I hand this off uh, for a fuller introduction um, by my great colleague Peter Hahn, uh, I just wanted to note we've got several really exciting events coming up that are directly related to this topic. Most importantly and notably, uh, Friday, March 31st, in the Thompson Library, pretty much all day on the first floor, we're hosting a 20th anniversary of the Iraq War Conference on the legacies of the conflict itself, involving some fantastic scholars and scholarship, uh, including journalists writing the first draft of that history, a history that we now have actual historians using primary sources and uh, interviews, which we'll hopefully be hearing some about today, uh, doing that work to reconstruct that history. Uh, in addition, um, uh, please note that on April 6th, uh, we have a, an event on the nature, uh, nature at War with Professors Nick Breifogel and Pete Mansour, uh, and a 2023 Military Frontiers Graduate Student Symposium on April 21st. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to Peter Hahn to do our formal introduction and simply say, welcome you all uh, for the Mershon Center, and special welcome to Mel Leffler. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. I am indeed honored to welcome Melvin P. Leffler back to Ohio State University for a discussion about his new book, Confronting Saddam Hussein. Mel is the Edward Statinius Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Virginia and one of the nation's foremost accomplished historians of U.S. foreign relations. He's published six books, six monographs, and seven co-edited volumes on a range of topics in the history of American foreign policy from the 1920s to the present. Among the many awards his books have won are the Bancroft Prize, the Beer Prize, the Hoover Prize, and the Farrell Prize. Mel's many academic distinctions include the Harmsworth Professorship at the University of Oxford, as well as fellowships from, from the University of Melbourne, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, the Woodrow Wilson International Center, Cambridge University, the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Library of Congress, and the Nobel Peace Institute in Oslo. Mel has provided esteemed leadership within the academy, serving terms as dean 
of the College and Graduate School of the Arts and Sciences at UVA and as president of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. Finally, Mel has demonstrated exemplary service as a teacher at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. He has supervised some two dozen doctoral students to completion, and I am honored to reveal that I was his second PhD advisee, uh, that at a time when he and I were both at Vanderbilt University and were both considerably younger than we are now. You might have noticed that I began this intro by welcoming Mel back to Ohio State. That's because he earned his PhD here in our history department in 1972 under the mentorship of the late Marvin R. Zahnheiser, and since that moment has brought great distinction to our program here at Ohio State. We're going to engage in question and answer uh, discussion of Mel's book. I'll pose questions to him and uh, maybe some follow-up questions, depending on how thoroughly he answers my first question. <laughs> A little bit of vengeance here for History 305 in 1982. <laughs> um, we, we will try to wrap up our back and forth in around an hour and save the remaining time for questions from the floor, including questions that come in electronically from our online audience. Now let me start off with a question about the timing of the decision made by the US government to invade Iraq in March of 2003. Critics of President Bush have suggested or charged that the president was determined to unseat Saddam Hussein from the first day of the, president, of, of the US president's term in office, or perhaps soon after 9-11 he became determined to invade. The evidence is, uh, for that include comments that President Bush made or the fact that he directed the Pentagon to plan an invasion, to get ready for an invasion. Your book, by contrast, suggests and presents evidence that Bush did not make a definitive decision to invade until around January of 2003 and even then paused for several weeks to give the United Nations one more chance to head off a confrontation and avert a war. Um, how confident are you in that finding about the timing? And do you think your critics will be persuaded? <laughs> let, me be, let me begin before answering uh, Peter's questions uh, by saying how delighted I am to be here, uh, especially at a program sponsored by the Mershon Center. The Mershon Center was the first place that supported my work and provided me with a fellowship when I was a, a doctoral student, so, uh, and probably uh, was a very uncertain choice at the time, and uh, I've always remained grateful for the investment that Mershon put in me uh, some 50 years ago, and it enabled me to, to go to Washington to do the nitty-gritty research on my first book, and so I'm extremely indebted uh, to the Mershon Center, and it's really a delight to be back here at Ohio State. It's filled with lots of resonant memories. Not all great memories, but very vivid memories. So uh, a lot of apprehension about taking my oral exams and things of that sort. But um, okay, you're probably thinking, Peter, that I'm running away from your question. So uh, how, how confident uh, am I? Uh, I, I'm pretty confident about what I argue with regard to the timing of the decision. Um, it's easy to be confident because the book itself is ambiguous about the timing of the decision, uh, except to say that it was relatively late in the game compared to what most other writers have said. Uh, I do place the final decision somewhere in January or February of 2003. This merits some systematic discussion because in the literature there's a great deal of, of writing that stipulates that when the administration came to power in January of 2001 that President Bush and his advisors were dead set on going to war in Iraq and, bring, uh, and bringing about regime change. And I actually was willing to uh, 
investigate that and entertain that as a real possibility. What I found in the evidence, Peter, was uh, absolutely uh, persuasive evidence that the administration, although desiring regime change, just as the Clinton administration had desired re regime change, had not the faintest idea of how to bring about regime change. There was much discussion of regime change in a vague sense. There was even more discussion of various specific problems that Saddam Hussein's regime aroused for American policymakers. But there was no commitment whatsoever prior to 9-11 to do anything concrete, really, to bring about a transformation uh, of the regime in Iraq. The real turning point was 9-11. 9-11 produced enormous anxieties, which I, I hope we'll talk about uh, more extensively. But in, in terms of focusing on Iraq, Immediately after 9-11, I show in my book, and here the evidence is unmistakable, that there were policymakers like Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and Paul Wolfowitz, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, who immediately focused on Iraq as a possible target for the American response. What became absolutely clear to me was that President Bush rejected those proposals and assigned priority, absolute priority, to Afghanistan. He did not say that Iraq was out of the picture, but he said that Iraq was on a back burner, that there were more important tasks to deal with, especially deal, dealing with the al-Qaeda tra training camps in Afghanistan and with the Taliban regime. In addition, what people often mistake is the fact that there were other countries during these first weeks after 9-11, other countries than Iraq and Afghanistan that actually attracted the attention of President Bush. He was extraordinarily concerned with the possibility that al-Qaeda terrorists might secure weapons of mass destruction from Pakistan. Pakistan was an overriding concern, and President Bush himself spoke to President Musharraf two times during the weeks following 9-11, uh, and some of his most important advisors not only spoke to top pa Pakistani leaders, but actually went to Pakistan to talk to them in person ab about this. There was a focus on the Philippines. There was a focus on Indonesia and dealing with terrorist groups in, th in those places. So Iraq was a focal point that's often stated because Donald Rumsfeld did write some, some notes that immediately focused on Iraq. But the important point I demonstrate is that President Bush rejected this advice. Subsequently, after the Taliban, after the Taliban government was removed from power in Afghanistan in late November, early December 2001, and when the training camps of al-Qaeda fi fighters uh, were raided and discovered by American spe special forces. There was the discovery that al-Qaeda was unmistakably seeking weapons of mass destruction. In incontrovertible evidence that al-Qaeda was seeking to acquire or develop biological and chemical weapons. And it's during this period of time, because of a convergence of other factors that I'll be glad to speak about, that President Bush's attention actually begins to focus primarily on Iraq. This is in December, very late November 2001, early December um, uh, uh, 2001. During this period of time, President Bush, for the first time, for the first time, requests the Central Command, General Tommy Franks, 
to begin working on a revised war plan for Iraq, a revised war plan for Iraq. This first begins in December of 2001. But what I show systematically in the book and what is very important and what is often misconstrued is that war planning, war planning did not mean a commitment to go to war. Almost all the literature suggests, either explicitly or indirectly, that once the war plans were underway, war was inevitable. But what I show in the book is that almost all of the most influential generals, including Tommy Franks, the head of CENTCOM, Central Command, did not believe that President Bush was inevitably and, alter and unalterably committed to going to war in Iraq. In fact, after Tommy Franks met with President Bush at his ranch in Crawford, Texas in December of 2001 to discuss the first iteration of the war plan, Tommy Franks told interviewers, not me, but other interviewers, Tommy Franks told interviewers that he did not get the impression during his long discussion with President Bush that the president was committed to going to war. I did not get that impression at all, said General Franks. What I did get out of the interview was that we would, as a result of the war planning, we would be much better prepared to take action should the president in the future decide to go to war. And what I tried to show that in the months after this, despite all the war planning that went on in the spring and summer of, of 2002, until August and September, when deployments really begin to take place, there was great uncertainty in the Bush administration about whether the president was really committed to going to war. So a key aspect of my book, Peter, is to emphasize contingency and agency. And one of the important aspects of the book is to realize that Saddam Hussein has agency in this whole process. If Saddam Hussein had acted differently during these many months, the outcome might well have been different. And we can discuss that more. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. I, um, I'll return to that topic, uh, time permitting. On this question of war planning, though, that raises the concept, of course, of diplomacy, which your book um, examines in some length. In fact, I think there's a chapter of that title. Course of diplomacy meant that Bush decided to ratchet up pressure against Saddam Hussein to force him either to leave power or to become a Boy Scout. That pressure included war preparations, war planning, and um, the alignment of force, forces in such a way that there was some teeth in the political pressure being put on Saddam. Now, you also acknowledge that that policy was risky because it put the US on a slippery slope, whereby if Saddam refused to change his ways, then the US might feel compelled to invade in order to preserve US credibility that had worldwide value. So was Bush gambling recklessly when he began that process of course of diplomacy when he stepped out onto the slippery slope because he was losing his own agency and letting Saddam Hussein decide by his action or inaction whether the US would have to go to war? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think to some extent uh, that, uh, President Bush was losing agency. Uh, and one of my criticisms of coercive diplomacy in the book is that the president did not really carefully assess or have his subordinates carefully assess costs and consequences before he embarked upon coercive diplomacy. He certainly should have done that. He should have asked, you know, ultimately, uh, if, we, if we embark on this policy of coercive diplomacy and if Saddam Hussein does not 
capitulate to, to our demands, and I'll get into that in a second, or if he does not flee, or if he is not overthrown, uh, then inevitably we're going to go to war because American credibility will be vested in the outcome of, of this policy. And hence, I think one of the lessons of this whole episode is that before you embark on a policy of coercive diplomacy, it is very important to think through the consequences and, and the costs of pursuing it. And President Bush uh, did not do that. But what he felt strongly was that he was providing an opportunity for Saddam Hussein to extricate himself uh, from this situation. And that is why I say Saddam Hussein certainly had agency. Uh, one of the important things to keep in mind during these many months, roughly from September of 2001 to September of 2002, which is an entire year, um, and so keep in mind that the notion that Bush rushed to war is questionable. A whole year elapsed between September 2001, September 2002. During this entire period of time, Saddam Hussein steadfastly refused to comply with UN resolutions. The UN monitors uh, under uh, Hans Blix, who was the head of the UN monitor monitoring team during these months, tried again and again to engage Saddam Hussein, to try to get Saddam Hussein to allow the inspectors back into Iraq. And President Bush said many times at many press conferences during this period of time, we are asking Saddam Hussein to allow the inspectors back into Iraq. If he has no weapons of mass destruction, demonstrate it to the inspectors. The very fact that he's refusing to allow them back cannot help but generate suspicions and anxieties about his behavior and his intentions. So during this entire period of time, Bush, while in part relinquishing agency, because if Saddam Hussein didn't do what was requested, the United States was embarking on a sequence that probably would force the United States to go to war, but Bush himself hoped and wanted Saddam Hussein to cooperate and acquiesce, as did the inspectors, as did the UN inspectors. And there were many discussions with Tony Blair between President Bush and Tony Blair about this precise issue. That's one of the important contributions of my book, is that by using British documents, I was able to recount the degree to which Tony Blair actually says to President Bush several times, as did his national security advisor, David Manning, said to Bush's national security advisor, Condi Rice, we need to be conscious of the fact, Blair says, to, Blair says to Bush, we need to be conscious of the fact that if Hussein actually gives in, if he agrees to allow the inspectors back, if he discloses and, and relinquishes his alleged weapons of mass destruction, that constitutes regime change. We will need then to be able to live with this regime and that war will not be the outcome. And Bush was not happy with this and neither Bush nor Blair really expected Saddam Hussein to agree, but they definitely were making the point to one another and I think I'm, convi I'm reasonably convinced that they believe this, that if he did cooperate, if he did act differently, then they, they would tolerate the continuation of the regime. Let, let me, I, I want to ask a follow-up question about Saddam's role, but let me try to pin you down on a different question, a different follow-up regarding the timing of Bush's decision. Um, I understand and appreciate your thesis that Bush didn't decide decisively until the early weeks of 2003 to launch the March 2003 invasion. 
But if he decided to engage in course of diplomacy a year before then, wasn't that in essence his decision to go to war? If, if he set in motion a train of events that was destined to lead to an invasion? No, what, it, but that's the point. It, in his mind, it was not destined to lead to an invasion, and, and that's the critical point. Should it have He's been not in his making mind? up his mind to go to war. He's making up his mind that Saddam Hussein essentially has choices to make. And if he makes the right choice, if he opens up Iraq and comports with the demands of the UN inspectors and discloses and relinquishes what people thought he possessed, uh, then there would not be war. If not, there would be war. And to that extent, he is vesting his credibility. And it is my argument, or one, one of the arguments of my book, that coercive diplomacy was a flawed strategy, partly because it did vest American credibility in a particular outcome before, before the president and his advisors carefully studied costs and consequences, and they should be faulted for that. Also, there were other problems with coercive diplomacy in the sense that the policymakers, including um, President Bush himself, never really clarified the overriding priority of coercive diplomacy. One of the interesting things is that when war planning began, Tommy Franks, the head of Central Command, General Tommy Franks, the head of Central Command, and Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, specifically stated their assumptions about the goals of a war should it take place. The goals of the war planning were two things. Regime change, WMD. That's what they, that's what they listed. Those were their two preoccupations. And I show in the book, those were also Bush's preoccupations. Regime change, WMD. But he never carefully resolved which of those two things was his overriding priority. And more seriously, President Bush never clarified that in his mind, should the United States go to war, there was another thing that he wanted to achieve, and that was democracy or freedom or something along those lines inside Iraq. Now, I make very clear in my book that President Bush did not go to war in order to promote democracy and freedom in Iraq, although a lot of people think he did. That is not why he went to war. But he did believe, he did believe, that if the United States went to war, if the United States went to war, a goal of the war should be to promote more democracy and freedom. A key problem, a key problem was that neither Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld nor General Franks shared that goal. Neither of the two most important war makers were really committed in any significant way to promoting democracy or freedom in Iraq. Bush was, if he went to war. But a problem with the decision making, as I emphasize in the, in the book again and again, was that Bush did not force his war planners, nor did he demand from Secretary Rumsfeld that they carefully plan for the prospect of democracy, promotion, or freedom after Saddam Hussein's regime was toppled. And that's one of the contributing factors to the chaos that took place in Iraq after the invasion. Let, let me ask a follow-up now on Saddam. Did Saddam remain defiant for rational reasons or on rational calculations like he thought Bush was bluffing or he thought the American people 
wouldn't tolerate the mass casualties that he expected them to suffer? Or was he driven by some grand ideology or some other less rational reason? And to what extent um, was his credibility on the line? Did he fear that if he backed down to Bush that it might cost him his power at home? So anyone dealing with this issue of the US invasion of Iraq has to constantly ask oneself about what constitutes rationality and what is irrational, what is emotion and what is rationality. Some very wonderful psychologists and, and historians have now pointed out that creating a strict dichotomy between rationality and emotionality is not a good way to understand policy making. But uh, from Saddam Hussein in his own mind, you tell me if this is rational or not, right? Uh, in his own mind, from his perception, he wanted the world to believe, he wanted his own people to believe that he had weapons of mass destruction. From his perspective, this was rational because weapons of mass, the perception that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction was necessary in order to deter the Iranians, in order to deal with the Israelis, and most importantly, the perception that he had biological and chemical weapons was critical for him in dealing with his domestic adversaries, meaning the Kurds in the north and Shia in, in the south. The fact that he could terrorize his own people, as he had done in the past, was an indispensable for prerequ prerequisite, as he perceived it, for his hold on power. So is that rational? Well, maybe not so rational. There, looming on the horizon, is an American invasion. <laughs> was it more rational to think, well, I better tell the world that I really do not have weapons of mass destruction because the Americans are about to invade with the British. Many of us, I think, wow, that would have been the rational thing to do. So sometimes when I impose my own views, I say, the Americans in December 2002, January and February, the deployments are really happening, the converging, converging of American forces and he's still sort of manipulating, concealing. Um, is, this, is this rational? To me, it makes no sense whatsoever. It seems irrational. But his advisors, Peter, were you know, subse subsequently asked about, about this. You know, with an American invasion looming, why, why did he not collaborate conclusively. Um, and they, they say, it was, his own advisors believe that until the last minute, Saddam Hussein did not really think that the Americans would invade Iraq and go to Baghdad and destroy his regime. He did not think that the United States had the will and the stomach to do this. He did not think that the United States would incur the casualties that he imagined the Americans would perceive. And he believed the Americans would think that he actually had biological and chemical weapons and hence would be deterred from doing this. And so they say, or one might extrapolate from that, that, well, that was perhaps rational based on Saddam Hussein's perception of American behavior in the past. What did he often talk? He often talked to his advisors about the fact that the Americans were paper tigers. Why were they paper tigers? They didn't march to Baghdad in 1991 uh, when they could have overthrown my regime. 
They didn't march to Baghdad. Why didn't they march to Baghdad in 1991? They were scared of casualties. In 1993 in Somalia, they pulled out and ran away um, and um, they didn't have the stomach to stay in Somalia. How about in 1998 when Clinton was so upset about, um, about the alleged concealment of weapons of mass destruction? What, what, what did Clinton do? He bombed us for three days. But would he send combat troops? No. So his advisors say that Saddam really thought that Americans would not actually invade. Ha, you know, so that th those are public, puzzling aspects of this question of this issue of rationality, irra irration irrationality. How do, how do you perceive what what is rational? And, and what about the question of whether Saddam could have made the concessions Bush was looking for and stayed in power? That's, of course, a, a, a critical issue. And the, there is much discussion, and I think really good analytic discussion and questioning about how could Hussein have actually demonstrated that he had no weapons of mass destruction when he did not have weapons of, 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 of mass destruction? That, became, you know, a, a that, that, that is a critical issue. And in well, the- Well, it, it would have taken complying, if he had complied with the UN resolutions and allowed the inspectors to come back in. Well, he, uh, yes. That well, would have been a demonstration of good faith and then the Western world could have inspected and verified that question. Right, and, and a lot of people say, well, Saddam Hussein allowed in the inspectors grudgingly uh, start, starting late November 2002, early December 2002, and therefore he was cooperating. That, that assessment is not an accurate assessment. It's partially true. It's partially true. Saddam Hussein, under pressure, under pressure, did, did, allow back the inspectors. But the first thing the regime was obligated to do, as he had known for a long time he would be obligated to do, was to provide the UN team with an extensive, what they call, declaration of the weapons he had possessed and an explanation, a detailed explanation of what he had done with those weapons in order to demonstrate that those weapons no longer existed inside Iraq. He handed this declaration, and it was extensive, really, really, I forget how many thousands of pages, because it was things that had been done in the past that he handed to the UN inspectors December 7th, Everyone was awaiting this, and everyone who looked at this initial declaration, everyone, this is incontrovertible, was dissatisfied with this declaration. They believed that nothing had been achieved, and they said it, and this was not just the Americans, and it wasn't just the British intelligence agencies, but Hans Blix and the UN monitors said this themselves. This declaration has accomplished nothing. Then in the subsequent weeks, late December, early January, early February, there is no doubt that Saddam's regime started to cooperate more and more with the inspectors. But Hans Blix, the chief inspector, was constantly dissatisfied with what, Hans, with what Saddam Hussein was doing. And he said in his reports to the United Nations, this is Hans Blix, this is not an American, this is Hans Blix saying, I still do not think that Saddam Hussein has made a, he used the term, quote, unquote, strategic decision to cooperate with, with the monitors. And when, and when Hans Blix himself and Mohammed El Baradai, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, when they went to Baghdad in January, Saddam Hussein refused to meet with them. And so it was illustrative that although some cooperation 
was occurring, and the UN monitors were not able to, f to find weapons of mass destruction dur during these weeks, there was still a strong conviction amongst the monitors, not just Americans, amongst the monitors, that Hussein was holding out. Hans Blix himself wrote in my memoir, in my heart of hearts, those are my words, but that's sort of what he was saying, I still believed that Saddam Hussein was cheating. Now, Hans Blix also was unbelievably exasperated with American officials. He was unbelievably exasperated with the, quote, impatience of the Bush administration. And he did not think the United States should go to war. He was extraordinarily op opposed to it. But at the same time that he was extraordinarily opposed to going to war, he also was saying all during this period of time that this regime still is not totally cooperating. And so this, these were the issues. And Hans Blix sort of used the term, again and again he used the term, the Americans and the Iraqis, George W. Bush and Saddam Hussein, are playing a game of chicken with one another. That, that's the term uh, he, he's, he, he used. And he said, I really don't know what's going to be the outcome of, the, of, this, of this game of chicken. What was interesting about it was that is exactly the way George W. Bush came to perceive what was going on. He thought that Saddam Hussein was toying with him. He thought that the regime was continuing to demonstrate defiance and intransigence. And increasingly, he felt, I, I have no option here uh, but really to go to war. Our credibility, my credibility, U.S. credibility is being tested here. This guy is toying with us, and we need to demonstrate our credibility. So that's part of what's going on Thank here. Thank you. Let, let me change the topic a little bit to the policymaking apparatus in Washington, D.C. Um, and what I think is a fairly straightforward question based on what you reveal in the book, so inviting a concise answer. Um, Critics of George Bush have suggested that he was sort of driven to war by the hawks around him, especially Vice President Cheney, Secretary Rumsfeld, and other hawks in the Pentagon and the neocon community. Was George Bush in charge? George Bush was definitely in charge of American policy toward Iraq. One of the great myths of this whole episode is the notion that Dick Cheney was in charge, or, the, or that President Bush was the pawn of the neocons. The evidence demonstrates that those notions are really totally incorrect. Bush but, made all the key decisions. And then as a follow-up to that, you develop in the book the concept of the clash of titans, which is a, a variation on what Doris Kearns Goodwin called the team of rivals. Uh, uh, quite a sharp contrast from the Lincoln administration. Um, in your Clash of Titans, you have Bush presiding over constant battles between hawks and doves, Defense Department, State Department, Rumsfeld, Powell, um, Wolfowitz and Armitage, F Douglas Fife and Mark Grossman. How skillfully did Bush handle that Clash of Titans? Was he flummoxed by it? or did he show any Lincoln-esque abilities to turn them into a team of rivals all pulling in the same direction? President Bush handled those rivalries very badly, but I would, I would amend your question by saying that these rivalries and the feuding generally were not played out in front of the president himself. Um, and uh, there was incredible feuding, and I think it's a really important factor in understanding why the decision-making and the occupation worked out so, so badly. 
But for the most, for the most part, uh, the arguments and the feuding uh, were, uh, were not displayed in front of Bush, partly because Bush did not really like to call his, all of his advisors together um, to talk about key decisions. And w one of the things that, uh, that I fault him for was the absence of systematic discussion. His inclination was to speak to different policymakers individually about things. That's not to say that there weren't group meetings, but ba basically, that when he really wanted to sort of deal with a critical issue, he would talk individually to Rumsfeld or to Powell, et cetera. He, he clearly should have known, and I'm not certain of the extent to which he did know, he actually did know, but he should have known about all the feuding and contradictions and differences in his administration. I believe that Condi Rice, the National Security Advisor, and Steve Hadley, the Dep Deputy National Security Advisor, were wary to bring these differences to his attention. And it's interesting in terms of personal dynamics. I, I don't have really concrete evidence to demonstrate this, but my sense of things was they felt, Rice and Hadley felt, that if they reported to the president just how badly things were going um, amongst his advisors, that it would reflect poorly on them. That Bush, ex that it would reflect poorly on Rice and Hadley, who Bush had every reason to expect was their job to keep people together and to generate you know, consensus opinions. And what's interesting, what's very interesting in the oral interviews that I conducted was the constant criticism of Rice and Hadley for, quote, seeking consensus that many people in the administration, like Paul Wolfowitz, Scooter Libby, Richard Armitage, regardless of the department, uh, constant criticism of Rice and Hadley was that they were struggling for consensus all the time, and that an era, an administrative era, a procedural era on their part was that they were unwilling to bring to the president's attention the fact that there were very different views about A, B, and C. And it's unclear to me to what extent President Bush actually knew about the intensity of those differences. Um, as, as late as 2004, as late as 2004, he gave an interview. I've just written about it in a short article in Foreign Affairs today, um, uh, that in a, an extensive interview in 2004 that he gave to the 9-11 Commission, he was still stating to the 9-11 commissioners, Condi Rice has been doing a phenomenal job dealing with the heavyweights in my administration, the thoroughbreds, quote, end quote, in my administration, the stars of my administration. Yeah, she's much younger and she's a woman, but she really knows how to deal with the, with the thoroughbreds. What's astonishing is that if he believed that, he was so mistaken <laughs> about it because she was not able to deal with it. And some of these thoroughbreds really treated her with what I would say was contempt. There are snowflakes, memo, short memos that Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld wrote that were called snowflakes that he sent all around the government to diff different policymakers all the time. But some of the snowflakes that I quote in the book were so contemptuous of National Security Advisor Condi Rice that Really, in all my years of research, I never saw another policymaker 
face to face, so to mm. speak, criticize another policymaker. In one snowflake, he actually wrote to Rice something like, if you do this again, if you do this again, I'm going to report you to the president. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, what's going on in a third grade class, right? When you misbehave and the teacher says, if you do this again to my granddaughter, Audrey, if you do this again, I'm gonna report you to the principal, right? I mean, that's what it was like, but Rumsfeld actually wrote that to her. What's interesting when you speak to Condi Rice, and even in her own memoir, is that she's not willing to really acknowledge just how contemptuous Secretary Rumsfeld was toward her. Um, but I think any objective analyst would say that he was, and that it had a very corrosive impact on the policymaking process. Thank you, and I th the, the evidence of that snowflake, I think, is ripe for a, uh, a cultural interpretation, but we'll uh -huh. save that topic for another day. Um, I want to ask you also about the outcome of the war. We might characterize, your book suggests indeed that the invasion of Iraq was a tactical military victory. The U.S. military and its allies demolished the Iraqi army, overthrew the Hussein government, occupied the country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in strict military terms, it was a remarkable victory. On the other hand, it was clearly a strategic debacle because the liberation led to a prolonged occupation, an insurgency roiled, um, American casualties skyrocketed after the initial invasion in a way that the invasion, that they had not during the invasion itself. So I'm wondering if in theory there was any way that the U.S. could have closed this gap between military victory and strategic defeat. Could they have come up with a strategic defeat by doing something, having better planning for the day after, by having a, a more enlightened administrative regime, calling the shots in Baghdad, by sending more troops, by telling Paul Bremer to start the numbering of his orders with three? Mm -hmm. Could any of those solutions have made a difference? I, I think that the um, so-called liberation and occupation could have turned out much better, whether that, that would lead to an overall favorable assessment of the decision to invade, uh, I'm not inclined to think was the case. But certainly, if, if Donald Rumsfeld and General Franks had agreed to deploy more troops and a different configuration of troops, there would have been uh, many more, much more likelihood that there would have been order and security in the weeks and months immediately following the overthrow of Hussein's government. There is no doubt whatsoever that the insufficient number of troops and the kinds of troops that were there were not appropriate to preserve order in the post-war situation. There were plenty of people who suggested that the configuration of forces and the number of forces was not sufficient, but um, Secretary Rumsfeld and General Franks basically, uh, this slightly overstates it, but basically dis disregarded those warnings. And in the immediate aftermath, in the days and weeks after Saddam was toppled, Rumsfeld made a sequence of decisions with regard to the rotation of troops that were very counter-effective in terms of the military's capability to preserve security and order. So more troops, better planning. When I say better planning, what I point out in the book is that some of the key aspects with regard, what are we going to do after the regime is toppled? M many of the key, most fundamental issues were not systematically addressed until February, March of 2003. 
weren't systematically addressed when the invasion was imminent. And so what, what, what were these? Uh, first of all, what are we gonna do with the Iraqi army uh, when it surrenders? What are we gonna do with the Iraqi army? The basic planning was that when the Iraqi army surrenders, we're actually going to try to use Iraqi troops to preserve order in post-Saddam Hussein's Iraq. The idea was to use his own forces to help preserve order. What happens is that many Iraqi, or the vast majority of Iraqi troops, disband when the Americans attack. They move away from, from, from various posts where, where they, where they had, had been. They burn their uniforms. They hide their weapons and they disintegrate into the civilian population. When, when American military and civilian officials enter Baghdad, they're totally aware of, of, this, of, of this situation. And based on the planning they had, they made efforts to assemble various Iraqi generals and military leaders to convene them together and to try to get them to reassemble their troops and to work with the Americans to preserve order. That's going on inside Iraq in April of 2003, while there's tremendous chaos and disorder. Let's get the Iraqi, we don't have enough American troops, let's get the Iraqis to, to help us. At that very moment, the administration makes a decision that, no, we don't want the Iraqi army, we want to disband the entire Iraqi army and all its military officers, the top command, the very people that the Amer generals that the Americans were talking to, no, no longer can receive their pensions, no longer are part of an Iraqi force that will work under our command. And for many weeks, there is total chaos with regard then to who's going to preserve order. So it's the absence of clear planning with regard to the numbers of troops, what to do with the Iraqi army, whether to purge the civilian agencies of the Iraqi government, whether to purge the top layers of the agencies of the Baathite supporters of Saddam Hussein. And there's disagreement amongst the Americans. How many Baathites, what levels of Baathites should be purged from the government? And this is actually a very difficult issue because on the one hand, there was tremendous pressure to get rid of the top layer of Baathites, many of whom, the vast majority of whom, are Sunnis. And there's an understanding that the majority Shia don't want these people and are incredibly intent on getting rid of them. At the same time, there's a realization that these Sunni Baathites in the top layers of the administrations are the key to effective administration inside post-war Iraq. So there, is, there, there are challenging issues to be resolved. Unfortunately, they're not very well resolved. And here again, you're asking me, would better planning, earlier planning, more troops have led to a better outcome? I certainly think it would have led to a better outcome given the fact that the outcome was horrendous, it would have led to a better outcome. Would it have led to a good outcome? I don't think so, but better, yes. And one of the things to keep in mind here is that the Iraqi people, 
the Iraqi people, were happy to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And to that extent, they were happy that the Americans were playing a role. What totally disillusioned Iraqis immediately, immediately, was the fact that the Americans could not preserve order and stability. Immediately, their lives were totally upset and agitated, their property insecure, their lives uncertain. There were killings, there, were, there was incredible domestic strife on the streets of all the, key, of all the key cities. And Iraqis, truthfully, from the interviews that were done with them, Iraqis were bewildered. The Americans toppled the regime. The Americans are the hegemonic power in the world. And they are unable to preserve order inside our country. And Iraqis were, one, incredibly suspicious. There must be something going on here. The Americans may actually want this to be, to be happening. Or on the, on the other hand, they lost total confidence in, in, the, American in, in the American occupation. And what I try to show in my last chapter is, uh, which just focuses on the period from March of 2003 to August of 2003, that during these first five months, you can see happening all the developments that would lead to years and years of domestic turmoil and internal strife and unbelieving, unbelievable fratricide in, inside Iraq. Thank you. Let me ask one more question, then we'll open the, the floor to conversation. Uh, we have assembled here in person and via the internet an audience of teachers and students and citizens. Um, what, what's the most compelling lesson that we should learn from the topic of your book? Well, Peter, since I'm almost asked, always asked this question, I don't, I don't have one lesson, but I'll tell you several lessons, OK? okay? I'll, I'll tell you, all of which I think um, are, are, are pretty compelling. First of all, I would say one lesson is to modulate American fears, to calculate threat perception with more sensitivity. The notion that Saddam Hussein constituted, quote, an existential threat was a huge exaggeration. I believe that Saddam Hussein was a threat in, in a variety of ways. And there was legitimate reason to be apprehensive about Saddam Hussein's regime. But I think that the, there was hyperbolic fear. That, and so one of the keys here that to learn is Americans who generally never and never are threatened, and therefore, you know, any time anything terrible happens, we tend to magnify threats enormously, need to temper their threat perception. Another, th another important thing, very important, grasp the limits of American power. Grasp the limits of American power. One of the reasons the United States invaded Iraq, as I emphasize in my book, is the convergence of fear, power, and hubris. There was a belief that Americans can easily overthrow this regime, and Bush believed we can impose democracy or catalyze more freedoms and individual rights. There was a huge exaggeration of American powers, Amer of American power. The United States policymakers, Americans, need to grasp the limits of their power. Third thing is curb your hubris. I talk about hubris in this book a lot. <laughs> the sense of superiority about American institutions, the belief that people everywhere want to 
emulate American institutions. The notion that American soldiers will be welcomed, as, as Bush, Bush was told, and believed, with chocolates and flowers. The idea, there was hubris to this, to, to this notion, and it was coupled with a lack of understanding of Iraqi culture and society, history and, ex and experience. A fourth lesson, assess costs and consequences before you embark on a policy. Us carefully assess costs and consequences. The failure of the administration to systematically examine costs and consequences is truly baffling. Maybe it's explained simply by the fact that policymakers believe they had so much power, there would be very few costs and consequences. So these things are re related to one another. And then the last that I would say is clarify goals, clarify goals and define priorities very carefully. President Bush never made clear that if he invaded Iraq, he really wanted democracy, freedom, nation building. He did believe that if he invaded, he wanted that to be an outcome. But his subordinates did not systematically plan for that. And I think he should be held responsible. He didn't really ask enough questions. What will happen after the regime is toppled? I want freedom, he should have said. I want nation building. And he should have demanded systematic plans that would be functional in terms of bringing about that goal. He never clarified his own goals. Thank you. Let's open the floor to questions. If you'll raise your hand, we have uh, a microphone that will rove about the room. We'll start with him. Hi. So as you can see, I'm a student here. And I guess this is a hopefully a pretty basic question. You know, it seems like nothing's ever as basic as it sounds. But so, you know, I hear a lot about the Iraq war. And the one thing that I always hear differing accounts of is, did Bush ever believe that there were WMDs? And if he did, when did he stop believing it or start doubting that idea? If he did, when did he? When did he believe? When did he, when did he stop believing there were WMDs, oh. if he really believed that? The, the latter part of your question is pretty clear. He only believed that they didn't after the invasion and when, when uh, weapons of mass destruction w were not found. Uh, I absolutely believe that President Bush believed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. I, uh, in talking, not to him because he did not allow an interview. I did not interview President Bush, but I interviewed almost all of the other key policymakers. One of the questions that I always asked them was specifically this question, you know, did you really believe they had WMD? And absolutely every single policymaker said they believed that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And the evidence, the actual evidence, the written documentation at the time shows that they believed it. But your question is extremely salient because although they believed it, and I'll explain why they believed it, they should have had doubts. They should have had <laughs> doubts. The information, the quote, intelligence information that was presented to them was fraught with ambiguities. And in a very compelling section of my book, I think, Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, actually asks his chief of intelligence on the, jo on the joint staff, asks him, how sure are we about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, about his chemical and biological and nuclear weapons. And the, the General Schaefer, the head of intelligence on the Joint Staff, writes about a 10-page memorandum 
to him, which is available. I mean, and basically he says, well, we're 30% certain about chemical weapons and 40% certain about this aspect of biological weapons, 10% certain about what we say about this, and maybe 50% certain about what we say. It's, the whole thing is, the whole document is written that way, percentages, that none of them is like 80%. No, 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 nothing like that. And then the last line, the last line of the memo to, from Schaefer to, to Secretary Rumsfeld is, so Mr. Secretary, the answer is, we don't know how much we don't know. Um, that, that's you know, what he writes. Now Rumsfeld, interestingly, takes the memo and writes a snowflake and writes three words on it. Quote, this is big, end quote. This is big. And he sends it with the, with the memorandum, the 10-page memorandum or whatever. He sends it to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I don't know what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff thought or did when he received that memo. But what is striking was Rumsfeld did not send that snowflake this is big, to Shaney or Rice or Powell, most of his snowflakes of that sort went to the other top policymakers. He didn't. So this just suggests, in the case of Rumsfeld and in the case of the president himself, there were numerous times when they might have stepped back and you might even say in retrospect, should have stepped back and said, does he really have weapons of mass destruction? Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do it? And the policymakers say this again and again, and I am convinced that what they're saying is truthful. They say, what we knew was that he had had weapons of mass destruction, that he had used weapons of mass destruction, that he had lied about weapons of mass destruction, that he had concealed weapons of mass destruction, and that he refused us and the UN the opportunity to investigate whether he had weapons of mass destruction. So there was every reason. They say to me sometimes in the interview, you're a historian, history taught us that this guy had weapons of mass destruction. Why? He had them, he used them. We'd be pretty dumb not to think that he still had them. And some of the policymakers have said, because other, uh, in recent years, other journalists and scholars have talked to intelligence analysts, and some of them have now said, oh, we had a lot of doubts. We had a lot of doubts. Um, and the policymakers should have known that there were that 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 we had a lot a lot of doubts, but in truth, the policymakers say, like Richard Haas, who is the head of the policy planning staff and is now the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Pre Richard Haas, he was an opponent of the war. He was a skeptic about going to war, but he says explicitly, "I never met." an intelligence analyst in all my time in government who told me that Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction. Nobody ever suggested that that was the case. So that, that helps address your, your very important question. Our next question comes from this side of the room. Thank you very much. Um, in regard to the war planning, you mentioned some of the names like Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Headley, Tammy Frank. There was one another important person of, among the neocons, which was Zalmay Khalil Zab. He did his undergraduate in American University in Beirut, and he was fluent in Arabic, and he knew about the Shia Sunni dynamics. Was there any input by him? Because he became the first American ambassador in the post-Taliban Afghanistan. And then when Iraq was invaded, he became the first 
post Saddam Hussein Iraq, he became American ambassador there. Was there any input by him when the war preparation was happening? Are you talking about Ryan Crocker? Is, uh, no, Khalil Azad. Khalil Azad. Oh, Khalil Azad. Uh, okay. Um, Khalil Azad was on you know, the NSC staff. And um, during, these form during this formative period of 2001 and 2002, and um, I, w I would s say, and, and he wa was charged with writing a policy paper to deal with Saddam Hussein. And he spent many months um, during May, June, July, August 2001, this is even before 9-11, working on a policy paper toward, toward Iraq. And it had numerous options, not, not, going to, not sending combat forces, but n numerous options. And the top policy makers in the administration Rumsfeld, Powell, Shaney, Rice, discussed this at some length in August of 2001, and they agreed that it had incredible problems, the, the policy, um, that it didn't address all the negative consequences of doing option A, B, C, or D. And so they didn't know really what to do with it. I, I described this in, in my book. And um, at the meeting, Rumsfeld takes the paper, the paper, and throws it on the floor and says, and it's a very dramatic moment. And he says to Pal and to Shaney, he says, um, this is the worst policy imaginable. This paper is the worst paper imaginable. But can anybody produce a better paper? Is it possible to produce a better paper? We really need to get the best minds together, Rumsfeld says, the best minds together to really work out all these issues. And they never do. That's, that's the way it's addressed. So Khalil Azad, um, I think is during this period of time, in terms of planning for the planning what to do with Iraq, and then after 9/11, planning for the invasion, he is not a critical policymaker. But your your question is very salient because President Bush knew that Khalil Azad uh, was the only Muslim on the N NSC. Um, and, um, and after 9-11, and Khalil Azad writes about this in his memoir, um, Bush, said, Bush asked Rice, Condi Rice, his, his Khalil Azad's superior, f to send Khalil Azad to Camp David for several, over a weekend, to spend several hours with the president. Khalil Azad describes this in his memoir. And, and he says, um, and Khalil Azad goes, and he, and President Bush says to, says to him something like, I really want to understand the Islamic fundamentalist terrorists. Why are they doing what they're doing? Um, why do they hate us so much? That's the way Bush presents it. And Khalil Azad only says in a sentence or two, you know, I talked to him about the problems of modernity and development in the Arab world, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, um, at, the end, at the end of this discussion, he says, Bush said to him, it's striking, Bush said to him, um, I, don't, I just don't understand this. I don't understand why they hate us. We mean so well. We mean so well. And, um, and uh, it's, uh, I use that in my book. It's sort of illustrative, I suggest at least in my analysis, 
of American hubris. I mean, the idea of our intentions are so good. Why don't people understand that? And I explain in the book that uh, intentions don't really matter to a lot of people. When American deeds, when American actions are often not commensurate with the idealistic language that Americans like to use. So Iraqis, for example, um, were extremely distrustful of Americans. The Kurds in the north were extremely distrustful. Why? Because Americans had sold them out periodically over many, over many years. Shia in the south were distrustful of Americans. Why? Because George W. Bush's own father had encouraged Shia in the southern part of Iraq to rise up at the end of the Persian Gulf War in 1991, and then Hussein crushed them, I mean murdered them relentlessly, and the United States did nothing to help them. So there was an immense amount of latent distrust that existed, and it was American hubris to think that, you know, Iraqis sort of look at our intentions. Oh, we want freedom and democracy, and that that would be mo more salient than what they had experienced. Our next question comes from over here. Yeah, Mel, will you talk a little bit more about uh, your first argument about the lessons? Um, there's an argument you made, as you suggest in the book, uh, uh, at least a few people in the administration held it, and a lot of people outside, including that New York Times ad, that even if Saddam Hussein got weapons of mass destruction, he would still be totally containable and deterrable. In other words, he couldn't do anything, much of anything, except uh, you know, be sort of a, a, a nuisance of some a minor sort. Um, the, uh, he didn't trust the Shia. He didn't trust his own army. He wouldn't allow the army to bring heavy equipment into Baghdad, for example, and he sure, sure as hell didn't trust the Kurds. Mm -hmm. uh, so he is presiding over a mess, and why, even if he had weapons of mass destruction, would he be considered to be a threat? So okay. the issue, that's yeah. the, the... I mean, actually, the policymakers talk about that a good deal, and, 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 it, and it's interesting. First, first of all, they, they to get at some of the assumptions in, in, in your statement, they certainly would not have agreed that deterrence and containment were working. The overriding perception in the administration, even by people who turned out to be skeptics or opposed to the war, they, they all believed sanctions and containment were failing. The regime, was, the, the regime of sanctions were collapsing and that Saddam already was rebuilding his convention, at least his conventional military capabilities. And as soon as the sanctions regime ended, he would have the ability to restart or accelerate his weapons of mass destruction. So they believe that that's a given. So your, your question is then, well, big deal. So they have weapons of, of mass destruction. The perception, and this comes out in a lot of the uh, se in a lot of congressional hearings that in which Secretary Rumsfeld and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz testify, and it's not just about Iraq, it's about North Korea, it's about Iran, and what they say, what they, say, what they are worried about is that should these regimes, should Saddam Hussein acquire and develop weapons of mass destruction in the future, it will affect, it will affect what we Americans will be inclined to do in a future crisis. There is an explicit apprehension that an adversary's possession of weapons of mass destruction will impel us or our successors in Washington to self-deter. Uh, 
to not take the actions in a crisis that we would ordinarily take if we thought they did not have weapons of mass destruction. And that's, you know, that's what's playing out today, right, John? I would say in terms of um, you know, what's going on, why we're so preoccupied with Iran. Um, why you know, we're you know, preoccupied, and, and I think it plays out, I think about this every day. I wonder how, how you respond to this. Russia, would, would, would we be as cautious today in what we're doing in Ukraine if Russia did not have weapons of mass destruction? Would, would, Putin, would Putin be doing what he's doing if he knew Ukraine had weapons of mass destruction? So it's a question of, um, your, your question raises how policymakers perceived a dynamics of contingencies over time in the way the United States would exercise its future power. So there are two elements in my, in my book to American fear. One is the real fear that Bush had weapons of chemical and biological weapons, and those weapons might find their way into the hands of terrorists. Maybe Al Qaeda, maybe other terrorists. That's one fear. The other fear is the one I'm explaining to you now in terms of maybe he doesn't have weapons of mass destruction right now, but he will have them when the sanctions regime breaks down. And when he has them, we are worried, we are fearful that we will not be able to deal with him in a crisis the way we've dealt with him before. That, that, that's it. We have time for uh, one more question. And before we, we get to that, I just want to thank on behalf of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies, Professor Leffler, for joining us today, and invite everyone next Friday, March 31st, to join us in Thompson Library, room 165, for Shock and Awe, uh, Legacies of the Iraq War uh, 20 Years Later. It'll be a conference that'll be going on all day there. And for more information, please feel free to visit mershoncenter.osu.edu. And our last question. I'm sure that we, we must have had some dialogue going on with the intelligence services of our allies. What were they telling us? Did they come to any, have any different information or come to any different conclusions yeah. than we did? Great, great question from, from what the written record suggests. And I have the evidence from Carl Ford, who was the head of intelligence and research in the Department of State. And he wrote a number of memos to Secretary of State Powell and to Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage in which he explicitly states, all our allied intelligence agencies agree that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and particularly biological and chemical weapons. Um, and that is stated by Carl Ford explicitly in a series of memos that he writes in late 2001 and then in the, in, in the spring and, uh, and late spring of 2002. All our allies agree with this. And in my interviews, when I've asked policymakers, repeatedly they have told me that the foreign intelligence agencies believed that, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Um, and uh, now Jacques Chirac, the president of, uh, of France, um, may, not have, may not have believed it, and I've asked about this, but the response has been, I've not seen the evidence to corroborate this, but the response has been, Chirac didn't believe it, but I was told that French intelligence agencies believed that Saddam had chemical and biological weapons, even though Chirac may, may himself not, not believe it. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but Chirac would have agreed, or definitely agreed, with what John was suggesting. Um, even, if, even if Saddam had it, it's not an existential threat. We, we can live with it. That's why the French were so opposed 
to going to war. Of course, what Americans felt, well, it's easy for the French to say this. It's easy for the Germans. They haven't experienced 9-11. They have not been in power when a terrorist attack really occurred. They don't really grasp the ramifications of what it's like to be a policymaker when the United States is attacked. And that's what was tremendously on the mentality of, of top American policymakers. The idea that they had been in power when a terrorist attack occurred, they were embarrassed, humiliated by it, fearful of another attack, and hence were intent on thwarting any possibility that this would happen again. Well, this has been a very rich 90 minutes uh, for me, and I suspect it has been for many members of our audience as well. I invite all of you to join me in thanking and acknowledging Mel on a superior performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.